All right, welcome everyone to uh, the last installment of this year's uh, or this academic year's journal club. Um, and uh, today's topic is really looking at uh, TAVI specifically. The first three papers will look at TAVR versus, uh, versus SAVR uh, and focus on some of the longer term outcomes in the low risk population. So I think this is kind of where a lot of the debate has emerged over the past little bit. and. Uh, as has been pointed out by some of my colleagues, uh, the recent AHA 2020 valve guidelines even made a point of indicating that people over the age of 65 with severe aortic stenosis should receive a TAVI as opposed to a SAVR. And some of that is based on what they feel are as longevity data and, uh, and, 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 and expected survival in that patient population. But I think as we'll start to see from some of the papers today, that maybe that's not necessarily the right tack uh, and then, of course, we will talk a little bit about an interesting topic, which is the role of PCI in conjunction with TAVR in people who have coronary disease. So that was a, so on, on behalf of Saurabh and myself, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I feel like another hopefully successful installment in the, in the Journal Club series and, and look forward to more of these uh, going forward. So the first talk uh, is going to be given by JF. Um, and uh, JF's going to talk about the Partner 3 trial and its two-year outcomes. Uh, title of which is Outcomes Two Years After Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement in Patients at Low Surgical Risk, uh, published in JAK this year in 2021. JF? Excellent. Thank you, Ansar. <clears throat> um, anyways, I, I'll, I'll present the paper, but I'll give a, two, two slides of data from us just to put in perspective. So it will sort of stimulate a bit of discussion, uh, just a little bit of a different tack. Um, so this is a partner uh, three trial, which all of you, I think we presented this about a year ago, just over a year of the one year outcome. So this is a two year outcome. <clears throat> just to remind people, uh, the partner three was a uh, thousand patients of low surgical risk and surgical risk was defined based on less than 4% mortality based on STS score. Um, and, uh, and these were symptomatic severe aortic stenosis from 71 sites. Uh, and they compared basically transfemoral approach for Sapien 3 valve, Edwards valve, versus a surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, and the surgeons were generally encouraged, and that's important a little bit, as you'll see, to select the valve site as large as possible uh, using a variety of techniques, uh, including root enlargement and all those things. And just to remind people, uh, it's a little bit of unusual is at you know, 20% of those patients actually had a concomitant procedures, many of which were root enlargement, which is not always common in everyone's practice. And as you might imagine, uh, the more things you do to the root potentially adds a little bit of risk. Um, so um, going forward with that, whoops, sorry, and the next slide, um, it's an as a treated uh, analysis, and that's the AT analysis. There's a, out of a thousand patients, essentially 490 to 450 in each of the group were followed for two years, almost you know 99%, 94% .99 follow-up available or 96.5 to be exact for the primary endpoint analysis at two years. So it's really good. Uh, in terms of study, you know, um, and uh, there's a few tidbits about the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint is a composite endpoint, which I'll talk about in a second. The population, I'm not gonna go into details, particularly uh, partly because this was published on the original study, but you should know that these were a little bit younger patients. The mean age was 73 years. Uh, they were largely males. And the STS, your, the STS score of 1.9 means a less than 2% mortality predicted. So they were low risk patients. They were younger than the previous trials, but they were not young patients. And I think that's an important distinction to think about as Ansar pointed out. Um, this is really the, the, the primary outcome. And as you can see uh, in the upper panel here in the A, uh, the primary outcome is a composite of death, stroke or re-hospitalization of any sort over time. And the blue line is the tiger line does better all the way all along throughout the two years compared to the surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, and as you'll see, most of that difference is driven in the first month. Uh, hospital, which they were clever when always in the first 30 days have about a 10 to 12% readmission rate. And that's been constant for many, many years. And that's... Um, 
that's, that's driven by that, as you'll see a little bit again. So clearly, Tower uh, is better if you look at these three endpoints over time. Uh, and this looks at death and this year disappears at two years here in the next. So looking at the hard endpoints of stroke and death, it's it's interesting that death would, sorry, that stroke would actually increase uh, over that uh, second year period in that patient population of Haver compared to Saver, uh, a variety of, of, of hypotheses around that, but essentially uh, similar in both endpoints. And the last is quite interesting because it does point out to quality of life and, and that's often not reported how patients felt and TAVR was much better than surgical AVR. You might imagine that one month after surgery, patients in the TAVR group felt better in general than the surgical, whoops, sorry, go back. But that difference was, uh, was less so at 12 months and 24 months. Largely, essentially TAVR is an excellent procedure as you might imagine. Uh, you can get excellent outcomes in these patients and they do very well. And this is clearly demonstrated here when it's compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, whoop. Uh, it, it is important when we think about composite outcomes because uh, composite outcomes are obviously chosen for a particular reason when you design a trial. Uh, and that's often you get death. Death uh, never was essentially at two years at 3.2 versus 2.4. Uh, obviously a little bit higher for surgery than TAVR, but not significantly different. The same for disabling stroke and readmission to hospital. This is where the main difference was in the early part and drives the composite outcome. Uh, and that difference appears to narrow down a little bit over time and it narrows down in all of the outcomes. So it's interesting that both, that all of these, these curves seem to narrow down over the period of two years. Um, there's a few other outcomes that are important to know that they've looked at. Uh, th in this table here, uh, you can. I, I won't focus on the one year, but if you focus on two year outcome, uh, new onset of atrial fibrillation uh, in the SAVR group was very high, and that's the one month readmission rate. We think of, of atrial fibrillation rate at about 30% patients post operative. Uh, in valvular heart disease, it is higher. In this population, older, it is not unexpected. And this is what that largely driven that. And here, a new left bundle branch block would obviously be more common in the TAVR group versus the SAVR group. Uh, but again, that uh, does not necessarily result in an admission to hospital. Um, the next outcome is worth mentioning because it is something that you, uh, you would see clinically uh, is this, this idea of valve thickening or valve thrombosis, which is not something we tend to think very much in surgical aortic valve replacement. I'm not sure I fully understand why it occurs at a fourfold higher rate in TAVR valve. Is it something about the crimping the valve, the way it's deployed, the way it's treated or dealt with? And the definition for that is a mean gradient of greater than 20 or an increasing gradient after the procedure of a greater than 10 at follow-up echocardiogram. And this is then verified by high resolution CT. And this is why some of you have seen many of us based on echo findings, we would order high resolution CT to see. And these patients often luckily respond to anticoagulation therapy to try to help that. Uh, but it's interesting that it's something that's more common in the TAVR valve and whether or not that will impact longevity of these valve is something to think about uh, and, and potentially would. Uh, so in, in in the end, the perspective and conclusions of the trial is essentially compared to surgical aortic valve replacement in low risk patients, balloon expandable TAVR was associated with lower incidence of composite endpoint of death, stroke, and rehospitalization at two year. But between year and one and two after TAVR, there was more death, stroke, and episodes of valve thrombosis, which led obviously to the curves uh, uh, narrowing down their gap between the two of them. Uh, the translational look and for us to think about is really around the long term aspect of follow-up that is needed to determine obviously the value of TAVR given the change in the curve and the change of things over time. And then I'll take just a few slides to show you a bit of, a, of, of, of analysis. I think the uncertainty is around age. I think while uh, the, the paper clearly state that there are younger patients than, than the previous trials, the previous trials were closer to 80 in terms of age. These were still in the, in the 73 to 75 years. So they are younger, but not young. Uh, there is still a four times higher thrombosis rate, uh, and there is still um, some moderate PDL leak, even if it's very low. And I didn't show you that data, 
Uh, it is obviously higher in the tabular valve than the surgical aortic valve. Remember also that excluded from this trial were all bicuspid aortic valves and anybody without acceptable transfemoral access. And that's uh, open to judgment a little bit depending on the enrolling site. So practical consideration, Saver versus Taver, essentially the way we think about it here, uh, Saver, we tend to favor for young patients. And obviously that's changing over time. How we think about it, very severe calcification in which we might not get a great seal with a tra transcatheter valve. Bicuspid aortic valve is often not a consideration, but often severe calcifications are associated with these two things. Prognostic coronary disease, you might want to revascularize with surgery potentially, and then I'm sure Brent is going to talk to us about uh, PCI related in those patients. Severe peripheral vascular disease, we tend not to approach patients with other uh, uh, access. We'd rather a surgery as an option, and obviously low coronaries, that's a risk for TAVR. And obviously the TAVR patients that tend to be older, severe calcification is uh, not, sorry, that's uh, less severe calcification, um, significant comorbidities. Uh, mobility issues, need for origin treatment of a variety of sorts. So there's obviously other reasons you might want an expedited treatment in which you get recovery that is much easier and better and faster. So Tavri at the Heart Center, just two slides to close off. This has been the evolution of Taver at the Heart Center. You can see that in 2010, you know, there were, uh, I can't remember, I think it was nine cases and it's evolved to 124 cases in 2020 and it's probably gonna be closer to 140 plus in 2021. So it's a steady increase over time, obviously. Um, and this is just an idea just for the Euro score. If we think of low risk patients, this is all TAVRs. We've done 625 TAVRs. The uh, STS Euro score for the entire population is 3.8, but it started at around 10. That means a mortality predicted of more than 10% in the origin of the, of the, study, of the, uh, of the patient population. And now in 2020, the average Euro score is very similar to what this trial showed at 2.5%. So we're essentially following that evidence. Uh, and our mean population age was 77 years old in that group. So not very far from what we currently do. Okay, there you go. Stop sharing. Right, well, thank, well, thank you, JF. That's great. Uh, great, a great summary of that first topic. Uh, I guess just maybe a couple of uh, questions. Um, just specific to the study, number one is just the concept of rehospitalization. Now, I know they refer to it as cardiovascular rehospitalization, but do you have any more data as to what that is? I mean, you and I both know that rehospitalization tends to be quite subjective, and it could be from anything as simple as you know atrial fibrillation to as complicated as a recurrent, you know, an, an MI or yeah. or heart failure. So, yeah, no, I mean, I think. You're absolutely right. So it is subjective. We tend to see a little bit more peripheral hospital for us, re-hospitalization that we do centrally here in this province. But it was a driver of the outcome in this trial and it was chosen and agreed upon as an outcome for the trial. So the trial was, uh, was designed in that manner and it clearly is an outcome. But you can see that all of those events occurred in the first 30 to 40 days at the early outset of, this, of the, uh, the intervention. So, you know, if you'd looked at it in a different way and you didn't have that outcome, perhaps you, you we wouldn't be necessarily talking about it the same way. But uh, it is still something there, and we'll we'll be talking about it for years. <laughs> um, but I, it does highlight that you, that you need to be a little bit careful when you look at the trial and the evidence and all of the things that are included in it. Yeah. So, JF, my question that rises from that is: Do we know what the rehospitalizations were? For, like, you know, is it renal failure versus yeah, infection the most, versus the, the most common is heart failure, and the most secondary reason is rhythm. So, heart failure, and that's fluid overload generally. And that's classic for surgery. So, 30% of those patients fluid overload, and 30% is rhythm related, usually atrial fibrillation. So, given that, you know, surgery had the excess within the first month or so, and after that, it looked like the rehospitalization rates were relatively equivalent between the two. Like, you look at the slopes, and they were relatively yep. equivalent. Were the reasons for rehospitalization later similar? Um, I don't. I don't know. And and yeah. I guess I don't know the answer to that. The thrombosis. Good question. There is a no. Most of rehospitalization for thrombosis is not an issue. It's something that's often it, it does point out that thrombosis is often either asymptomatic or mild symptoms. It's driven largely because of protocol driven echo, the same as we do. 
So we do follow up echo and with follow up echo, we see a gradient increase, gradient increase triggers, oh my God, it's increased more than we thought. But if you look carefully at these patients, some of them do complain of, you know, lack of egg. I mean, they're older patients, they don't necessarily complain very much. So um, it is amazing. So the, I don't know what to make of the valve thrombosis part. Yeah, it is, yeah. It is clearly ex it there, uh, but it's a lot driven by, if you didn't do these routine echoes, you might not have reported this. But there's definitely a differential between SAVR versus CAVR for thrombosis. And there's something, you know, there's yeah, something, there's something that... a bit, there's something a bit different because these patients follow the same follow-up protocols. Yeah. I wonder, you know, when we do our sutureless valves with the Percival, if they would have a, I'm just wondering if it's something to do with the mechanism by which they're stored, they're crimped, they're, you know, yep. they're, re they're deployed. I don't know. It's, it's, it is curious, but uh, like I, you said, I, oftentimes I, it's an incidental finding, not a, not yep. a finding that results in anything. Okay, well, great summary. Thank you very much. Uh, before we kind of uh, delve into how this should impact our practice, let's maybe go over the next two studies and then we can kind of, as a whole, discuss you know what we should be doing differently, if anything at all, at the Heart Center. So second study, uh, Brent, I will get you to share your uh, slides, um, is uh, a study that was also recently published uh, in the American Heart Journal. And uh, this particular study uh, is not a randomized trial, uh, and, but rather a case control uh, type study. Uh, and it is entitled transcatheter aortic valve replacement in low risk patients. So Brent, are you doing concomitant PCI and TAVI or are you doing- Yeah, I'm doing PCI and TAVI. Vern, what are you doing? Staying far away from it. <laughs> what, what were you assigned, Vern? I was assigned the same topic, but a different paper. Hmm, that's strange. I thought I gave you uh, the transcatheter, the, L the LRT study. Uh, okay, well, that's awkward. <laughs> but, okay. it's, but, it's a, but it's a different paper. And sir, do you want me to do the other? Uh... Yeah, I will. Okay, so why don't I jump yeah, to let's Chris? Do that. Yeah. Why don't I jump to Chris? Uh, and then I will, um, okay, fair enough. Let's, let's jump over to Chris. So, uh, I'll get you to unshare. Perfect. Thank you. So Chris, I'll you've get got, you to, you've got five minutes. You've got five minutes to prepare. <laughs> That's okay. No, no, we'll, we'll figure this out. I, I apologize if I accidentally sent people, I thought I would have sent people a different study, but, uh, so, um, so yeah, so Chris can, uh, Chris is going to talk about, this is a five-year follow-up study. Uh, looking at mortality in uh, right. low-risk patients with aortic stenosis, undergoing TAVI uh, versus SAVR. Uh, and this is the kind of a reconstructed meta-analysis. So uh, Chris, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, th thanks, Ansar. So this is um, a patient-level meta-analysis of, of uh, low-risk trials, um, which I think, you know, I thought, even though this isn't published in a big-name journal, I think is really the best evidence with longer term follow-up in this patient population. I think really worth uh, discussing. First, I wanted to just uh, talk about the second point here, which is these are the new 2020 HA guideline, valve guidelines. And I think point number two in my mind is what has generated a reasonable amount of controversy in the, uh, in the cardiac surgery, cardiology community is this new statement saying for symptomatic severe AS, if you're 65 to 80 years of age, um, either SAVI or TAVR is considered uh, reasonable. And when you look at the papers that are cited to support this, number one here is a, um, a meta-analysis of four different trials. 10% of these patients are low risk patients. Um, and the mean age is between 79 and 83 years of age. And the other four, or these other trials, four to eight, are all intermediate and high risk trials, which I think is a bit concerning that, you know, this statement is saying in a 65 year old, it's reasonable to consider TAVI, yet none of the data they're citing is actually supporting um, uh, uh, TAVI in that kind of an age group of patient. And um, when you read further in the guidelines, or point number one here is saying, you know, it, these are, uh, to consider in people who have a life expectancy of greater than two years, yet really all the data is two-year follow-up. So that's where I think this trial has some uh, merits, um, this study. And again, it's a patient-level meta-analysis 
um, of SAVR versus TAVR in low risk people. So SDS are less than four. Uh, three of the studies included were randomized trials and three were propensity match cohort studies. Uh, when you look, these are the trials they included. Um, when you look at, again, the mean age here is between 73 and 80 years of age. Um, the STS scores are all in the two to 3% range. Uh, when you look at the follow-up, so really the follow-up is Notion one randomized trial that had five-year follow-up and then this propensity match study had five-year follow-up, but um, that really is only 500 patients that had that length of follow-up. The rest is all in the one to three year range. Um, the vast majority of these are transfemoral. There's a smattering of, of transapical subclavian um, direct aortic, but the vast majority are transfemoral, transfemoral tabby. I, I know this is a busy slide. I just wanted to highlight again that these are, you know, though they're low STS score, you know, 10, 20% of them have coronary disease, 10% have had a prior stroke, uh, you know, five to 10% of a prior MI, and that same range of peripheral vascular disease, a quarter to a third of atrial fibrillation. So just to give an idea of the patient population they're studying. And again, the mean age being 73 to 80 years of age. When you look at their uh, outcome, so this is mortality um, in follow-up uh, out, to, out to five years, um, kind of as the, as the uh, partner three data that GF just prevented, presented suggests that um, after that initial increased burden of, of morbidity and mortality in the surgical group, uh, those curves start to come together and cross at about the 18 month mark. And beyond that time period, this data at least suggests that the curves uh, continue to diverge. So um, TAVI at six years had a mortality of 30% compared to 21% um, in the surgical arm. This did not meet significance. Um, so the authors did a, a, a landmark analysis and showed that if you take those who survive to, uh, to one year, um, then that difference at, at the five-year mark became significant. I think just highlighting what JF's study showed that um, uh, as time goes on, the uh, incidence of mortality stroke um, is higher in the, in the TAVI arm. So there really is no data to suggest what was driving those outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think strengths of the study is it's a patient level meta-analysis though I would say of good quality data. Um, three of the studies were propensity match studies and not randomized trials. This is really in the low risk patient population, uh, you know, the only data that really gives out to five years. And I would say it's still a long year for a long way from long-term follow-up in this patient population. Um, weaknesses, again, you know, includes propensity match data, and that really makes up about 50% of the data uh, at the five-year mark. And at the five-year mark, um, you know, there's really only 500 patients that they're basing that data on. Um, there's no data on the cause of death, so what is driving this divergence in the survival curves between the patient populations? And again, I would say that um, you know, the, how generalizable is this data to what the guidelines are, are suggesting that you can consider this in a 65 year old patient, you know, I would say that the, this trial data still is a long way off from a 65 year old uh, healthy patient with severe aortic stenosis. Um, that's it for, for this portion, uh, Antar, if you want questions now or, or, uh, or at the end. No, this is, uh, this is a good time because I think uh, the other study we haven't, we didn't cover the LRT study, but that's okay. And I mean, that was really just more of a case series of 200 low risk TAVI patients and looking at their outcomes. But once again, their average age, and even in that study was 73 and their SDS risk admittedly was low at 1.8%. Uh, but having said that, I think, you know, without sort of solid head to head comparative, uh, you know, da data, it's, it's hard to say that TAVI is superior and or acceptable as compared to SAVR just on the basis of that study alone. So I guess the million dollar question is, obviously you've, uh, Chris, highlighted the issues that exist with the AHA guidelines. And I think that that I think is number one, uh, because that's the kind of guidelines that is gonna drive practice, especially in the United States where, you know, they tend to be very guideline driven. Um, I, I guess the million dollar question then is, is, you know, what are we doing here 
and maybe I'll I'll let uh, I'll let uh, the three uh, Tavi people who are on the line right now speak to that. Um, Brent, uh, Vern, and and JF, what are we doing here? And and does this sort of fall in line? You know, I have you know JF, you kind of demonstrated some of that data, right? And you have shown that you know in 2020, as compared to the overall population, we were already moving towards a lower risk population. Uh, you know, the STS risk was definitely different. Uh, so are, are, we doing, are we doing the right thing here or are, have we kind of pushed the agenda a little bit too far to the right? And I know you've made some comments in, in the chat box, uh, but um, yeah, perhaps maybe you just want to speak to that and then we'll kind of move over to Brent and Vern. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I sat on an advisory committee nationally recently and um, <laughs> I was amazed at how, you know, in our center, we have, you know, interventional cardiologists and surgeons and all, we all sit together and review cases and review the patients. It is not the reality necessarily everywhere in Canada. There are some centers in, in Ontario in particular that we're showing that we're heavily, for example, 90% of the cases were surgical aortic valve, very strongly, while others with really strong heart team mentality and patients were not approached necessarily in a way that, okay, patient has aortic stenosis, can we actually pick the right and the best option for that? Based on, you know, all of our biases interpretation, our team concept is not something that's necessarily while it's advocated in the guidelines, it's not always the case everywhere. And we all have our biases that we bring there. Uh, and it, to me, it just highlighted the fact that, you know, as long as we can have discussions on most of these patients, there are always a variety. I mean, there's patient factors also that we don't even talk about in this uh, that become part of the discussion. And I, I don't feel, I, maybe I speak for my colleagues, but I never feel like I'm, I feel that strongly about any of the decisions we make. Uh, we tend to sort of agree, oh, this patient is probably more suited for surgery. This patient, yeah, is reasonable for TAVR for a variety of reasons. And we outline them and this is how we do it. Um, I, I feel that we're doing it appropriately at the present time. I don't feel in any way that we're not doing something that's, that's not right. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm sort of rambling a little bit. I'll let uh, Vern maybe and Brent comment on, on both of those things. Vern? Yes, I agree with what uh, JF said. I mean, we really do try to customize um, each decision for the individual patient. You guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, um, and some of these decisions are kind of soft. You know, we do look at uh, mortality, what we think their mortality is gonna be. And if, if someone is uh, 75 and they look really healthy, we think they're gonna to live to 100, then surgery is a great option. So we really just try and customize this. And I guess we are following a guideline of some sort, but perhaps not as hard as other people. And we've even had some very interesting discussions about um, sort of really young people. So if you're going to be 55 and get a valve and you think you're going to leave to be 100, then what do we do with those people? Should they have a TAVI now and a SABR later and then another open, you know, another TAVI later on? You're looking at sort of a life, a life of treatment for their aortic valve disease sometimes rather than just one particular procedure in isolation. Yeah, so Brent, I think Colin brought up an excellent point is, you know, what's your experience been in Alberta when you were a fellow uh, there and what, how does it compare to here in terms of practice? Yeah, I think our approach here is quite unique, uh, certainly nationally having uh, IR involved. Um, we, in truth, rely much heavier, heavily on CT relative to echo, whereas out west it was you know, it was largely echo driven for most of our um, sizing and, and a lot of the decision making around the valve. Um, so the group was smaller, uh, the imaging modalities we used were different. Now that may have changed in the last few years since I've left. Um, certainly the surgical interventional uh, interaction was, was similar when I was there. Um, there was a change in the dynamics after I had left, I know, and I think the group has changed some more on the surgical side, um, but it worked quite, you know, in a very similar way. Um, I think we may be a little more aggressive with some of the patients that we, uh, we move forward with. Um, I know in Alberta, there was a hard cap and uh, they were very aware of that. So if anybody was sort of 
you know, in any way frail uh, or there was concern, um, you know, they may not have gotten a TAVI or any uh, intervention for that matter. Um, we tend to be, uh, you know, we're much more patient focused and we don't tend to have to think about, you know, do we have another valve um, in the cupboard? And uh, so in that way, we're, we, we practice quite a bit differently. So I guess, uh, you know, my question is a little bit, uh, you know, we made a decision a couple of years ago when we first discussed partner three and we said, you know, that we should start to consider people over the age of 70, uh, you know, as, you know, with isolated surgical aortic valve, with isolated valve, aortic valve disease for either TAVI versus Saver. And that's kind of how we practice now. We pretty much, you know, everyone sees them, but they get, I mean, I feel like TAVI gets first right of refusal. Um, and, and unless there's an obvious contraindication to TAVI. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I'm not criticizing the approach. I think it's a good approach and it involves a lot of different people, but you know, from, from the standpoint of the TAVI team, uh, one, of the, one of the concerns was, was that we were gonna see an, an incredible influx of potential TAVI cases. This was gonna have an impact on resource utilization from a CT perspective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have we been happy with that decision? And do we so feel I can tell you, Anne, oh, sorry to interrupt you, but I can yeah, tell you ahead. from my own perspective that you know I do think the 70 plus crowd, my default is they're a tabby uh, until we unless we we can't do it. Um, that's always sort of been in the, my mindset since joining the group here. You know, you mentioned we're going to see an influx of AS patients, it feels like we have to be honest. I mean, I must see somewhere between five and eight AS patients a week, it feels like anyway. Um, so it does seem like there's a high volume of the disease out there. And I think the, the majority of them end up coming the tabby, down the tabby road. Um, I don't know if that's JF and Vern's perception, but certainly that's my own. So, yeah, so, just, when, when, so when the program was set up, I mean, and I think it still works this way, unless they're clearly very frail and elderly, the first right of refusal goes to the surgeon. It's a surgical consult first. And then the surgeon gets to say, well... Oh, I agree, know. Vern. Um, and, and that is the case. But I think most of the 70 plus crowd, even if they're relatively fit, it seems like the surgeons are often suggesting Tabby. Um, at least that's been my, uh, my perception. Well, I think, I think we made that decision, uh, you know, when the low risk data started to come out and we said, look, everyone over the age of 70 would be now considered for Tabby versus Saver. And I think, I know when I see that consult, I basically say, look, uh, you know, based on the data, happy to proceed with TAVI, uh, but will be ready to offer surgery if TAVI is not felt to be reasonable based on the TAVI assessment. That, I feel like that's kind of, at least yeah. that's my approach. Um, so I, I know what you're saying. I think we, you know, it's a kind of a soft writer refusal at the at our end. I mean, for the most part, we're like, we're happy to do it, uh, provided that you can't do it. And so I guess the million dollar question is, is that is that still the right approach or are we, you know, are we pushing too many people over to Tabby? With the data that both JF and Chris presented, would that suggest perhaps that we may need to step that back a little bit and wait this out because there seems to be a convergence in some of the key outcomes at two years and potentially even five years? Right? I mean, and I, well, I was just going to oh, say, if, if you don't mind, I think that. I think that the heart team is really, again, where the value is. Like there are some people that are 72 and totally otherwise healthy and fit that, you know, clearly TAVI has already been discussed with them. So it's in their, you know, it's, it's in their, um, it's on their mind. And, and then I'll often tell them, look, like, in all honesty, I think surgery is a better option for you, but, you know, why don't we get the TAVI CT, get all the data, and then we can have a discussion as a group as to what, what the best option is. And some of those people come back that, you know, clearly the TAVI team has talked about them and agree and they end up going for surgery. And some of them I don't hear about again and clearly have gone for TAVI. And so, um, you know, I think that the 70 shouldn't be a hard and fast rule, but rather a, a point where there's further discussion warranted and it's not black and white. That's my opinion, but maybe the other guys have, have a different uh, approach. No, Chris, I think you raise a good point with patients coming in, you know, mentioning TAVI um, specifically. That, that is pretty common. It's rare that someone comes in and mentions, you know, I want a surgical valve and not bring up TAVI. It's almost always the other way around. Um, so that, that definitely, uh, you know, I've observed that myself in many patients, even younger than 70. Like I've seen that happen in the, you know, 55 plus crowd as well. And then we have to tell them why that may not be the best approach. 
Um, so I have a question, um, and this relates to people one, that don't one, do tabby. Just one second, sorry. I think JF wants yep. to say something, and then I'll get you to your, get you to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I honestly wouldn't change anything other than maybe I, we rely quite a bit on on the letter that either Chris or you write when you see that patient. If you really think strongly that that patient should have surgery because he's a low risk, that is helpful to us when we evaluate them because I've seen them. We all talk about it. We all think about it. So don't underestimate the value of what you provide more mm -hmm. than beyond that. You know, if I don't, if he can't do it heavy, we'll do a surgery. So there is value there. And I still value a lot the, the discussion that we have on these patients. You know, I, Brett is right. We do see more patients, but the reality is we do three TAVIs on average a week. And our list is always around 15 to 20 patients waiting, despite potentially assessing five to eight patients. Many of those patients end up having surgery or being delayed or for a variety of reasons, we don't think that's the problem yeah. currently. So we are managing accordingly, I think. So I wouldn't change much. Perfect. Sarah, back to you. Sorry, Sarah. Um, yeah, quick question then for people who don't do tabbies, uh, like myself, and when we're talking to patients, many of them come with their preconceived notions. I want to have a tabby. They've heard about it. So what do what are the specific risks if a tabby valve a tabby valve fails um, ten years from now? What are the what are the surgical risks involved in dealing with a failed tabby valve or explanting that um, putting a tabby in another valve and valve or taking to the OR? Like, what do we tell our patients, our younger patients who are demanding tabbies now? Why are the what are the strong reasons to have a surgical approach first rather than a tabby valve? Uh, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, the, the honest answer is I, I honestly don't know other than valve and valve is always not quite as good. We always worry a little bit about it. And TAVI and TAVI is potentially also problematic depending on the first TAVI, how big it was. And uh, the surgical explant, you know, we explanted a few TAVI valves. They can be not without their issues at explanting. So uh, I would say it'll be riskier for sure. I can't tell you how risky it is. If you look at literature out there, it looks like the risks are higher, uh, but again, they're very limited experience. Do you think there's a difference in explanting the different types of valves? Yeah, I, I think it's harder to get, I mean, they, they can be harder to get out and, and, and damage to the root and access to the coronaries and- uh, My uh, bias, yeah. my bias is that the sapien valve is surprisingly pushes pretty damn hard on, on the tissue and uh, is a bit harder than the evolute valve on the, in the first few months. The evolute valve does fold quite nicely and is pulled out quite nicely. But I bet you over time when it really sticks to the wall and they do utilize, maybe it's not at years from now. So I don't know the answer. But compared yeah. to a, a surgical valve, Jeff? getting out a, a five-year-old surgical valve versus a five-year-old tabby? I, I, it, I don't know. I don't have enough experience to comment. I can, I, you know, I'm, theoretically, I would think that it's going to be a completely different beast, to be honest. I mean, uh, the fact that it's going to be embedded into like the, you know, I mean, embedded into the aortic wall has got to make it more challenging. But once again, you know, we don't have that experience. We've only taken out short-term tabbies, not and taken out- crush, And you have to crush them. You have to crush them. They won't come out otherwise. Right, exactly. So you, so, you try to crush them and collapse them, which is very unusual in surgical valve. Look, I yeah, was there, about there to have a few a, things. Yeah, yeah, I was about to have had a great experience of taking out a valve and valve tabby just a day ago, but I got harpooned <laughs> four <laughs> seconds, five minutes before the patient went into the room. So anyway, uh, I can't comment, but nevertheless, yeah, no, I think we'll find out because look, it's we'll going to happen. We'll next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's going to happen. I mean, at some point we're going to have to, we're going to have to deal with this much like, you know, as surgeons, we have dealt with, you know, stentless valves and bringing them back and, 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 and those have failed now and they were put in in droves 10 to 15 years ago. So I think this is going to be an issue. And I think Saurabh's right. I mean, it's going to be, this will all start to kind of affect how it is that we think about what should be first versus second versus third, you know, like, in, and, and just as Vern alluded to the 55 year old, I think you think is going to last till, you know, they're about a hundred. Well, the order of operations is going to be pretty key, right? And 
even the valve companies are starting to make valves like the Inspiris valve for the Edwards, which is which are designed to kind of really expand out and hold the biggest cavity possible. So, you know, we'll we'll find out. I think this is this is a, you know this is a journal club that's going to occur numerous times over the next ten years, um, and and beyond. Every year, every yeah. year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, look, it's uh, perfect. And I think that's a good discussion. I, and I think, you know, it allows us to reflect on our practice and, and the outcomes. Um, obviously, we had a bit of a, a bit of a snafu. And I think uh, I feel like Brent and Byrne have uh, reviewed the same paper. So in an effort to recognize their contributions separately, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of split it up. So uh, Brent's going to present kind of the background and the, and the methods. And, and then I let Byrne kind of speak to the uh, results and, and the discussion. Uh, so, uh, with, without further ado, the, the topic really is about looking at uh, the outcomes of concomitant uh, PCI and, and TAVR and, and um, whether or not the outcomes of concomitant PCI and TAVR are worse as compared to just TAVR alone. Brent? Yeah, I want to blame Vern for this, but it's all on me. I misread the email and I got excited by PCI. I just went with it. So, <laughs> no worries. All right. So, you know, the only disclosure is I like to stent things, so bear that in mind, I guess. Um, so this is the paper. Um, it's in a journal that admittedly I wasn't familiar with before, the Archives of Med Medical Science and Atherosclerotic Disease. Um, that's not saying anything about the paper, but um, it's not in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so it looks at outcomes of concomitant uh, PCI and TAVI uh, versus TAVI alone. Uh, so a few background slides. The so CAD is obviously common. Uh, severe AS is common. Um, and anywhere between 50 and 75% of AS patients have concomitant CAD. Um, and there's clear data on higher rates of adverse outcomes um, being more common in, the, in this uh, population um, than in those who just have sort of lone aortic stenosis. And there's some small, and I mean small, observational studies that have shown no difference in 30-day outcomes between concomitant PCI and TAVI uh, versus PCI followed by TAVI or just TAVI alone. Um, albeit, you know, many of these studies uh, have tended to show a trend toward worse outcomes in the PCI plus TAVI groups. Again, they're small observational studies with, you know, dozens of patients, not hundreds of patients. So, you know, it's a complicated calculus, you know, aortic stenosis and CAD, how do we manage that um, in, in the era of TAVI? Uh, there's really no consensus on the optimal approach. And I, and I can tell you, we discuss this regularly in patients who've got a lesion that looks severe. You know, what do we do with these people? Um, do we stent them first? Do we stent them during uh, the TAVI or do we leave it alone? Um, you know, it's, uh, we discuss this regularly and, and sometimes, you know, it's often a unique approach for individual patients, largely driven by uh, their presenting symptoms. Uh, so the objective of this uh, paper um, was to compare in-hospital periprocedural outcomes of combined TAVI and PCI during the same indexed hospitalization versus just getting an isolated TAVI with no PCI. Uh, the study population was extracted from the 2016 uh, nationwide readmissions data. Um, this NRD data is part of a larger healthcare cost and utilization database. Um, which they purport to be the largest collection of de-identified longitudinal hospital care data in the United States. Um, I, I take their word on that. I don't know, um, but it's, uh, it's a large database. They use ICD-10 codes to identify patients, um, and those patients who had concomitant PCI were defined uh, as those who had one or more balloon angioplasties, bare metal stents, and, and or drug-eluting stents in one or more uh, vessels during the same hospitalization as the TAVI. Uh, their endpoints in hospital all-cause mortality, length of stay, uh, cardiogenic shock, need for mechanical circulatory support devices, um, a mechanical complication of the prosthetic valve, uh, paravalvular leaks, acute kidney injury, bleeding, and total hospital charges. So that's sort of the economic uh, endpoint. Um, and there is a one-to-one -one parallel propensity score matching uh, based on the basic demographics and the basic uh, baseline characteristics. So a pretty uh, standard method for this type of database study. Um, so I can leave, Vern, if you wanna go over this part, I can, uh, I can share, let, let you uh, share your screen. Sure, yep. Wow, that is super collegial, by the way. Not lost on me. Good. 
<laughs> practice. It's the heart team. So a little concerned about the inability to share the screen. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I've not done this before. It's looking for some privacy issues. Oh no. This is yeah, this is a bit yeah. of a nuisance. Uh, okay. do you want to do you want to use uh Brent's uh result slides and just kind of go off that? Sure. Why don't we do that? Because it, okay. it takes it I'll takes a few minutes. Screen again. Yeah, it takes yeah. a few minutes to um, to go through your privacy settings, and I can't walk you through it. No, nope. it's okay. I'll have to practice that. So it was a, it was a large number of patients. They had uh, 20, 23,600 and eight hundred and fifty-two, which was uh, three point six percent, had a PCI during the index hospitalization. Actually, at the same time as their as their tabby. And uh, I didn't tease this data out, but it was mostly one vessel PCI, a couple of two vessels, and just a very small number of that, of the original small number, actually had uh, three or more vessel PCI. And this is a, an unreadable chart of the, uh, the, the matching of the systems uh, to, uh, to show that they're, uh, they're equal. Next slide, Brent. So it was performed before TAVI at 66% and mostly on the first day of admission. So I have I had a nice table, which is unfortunate, but anyway, this is this is okay. So so they had there's a big difference in all cause all cause mortality. So 4.5% to 1.7% good P value. They had a lot longer length of stay. But even their TAVI alone had a 5.4 day length of stay, which is was quite long. And this data is from 2016, but I think even in 2016, our length of stay would have been shorter than that for most of our patients. Yeah, I agree. I found that long as well. And uh, so they had cardiogenic shock in two point, well, two percent of their TAVI patients. And I don't think we have two point. 2%, you know, 2% shock. Uh, a lot. Mecha <laughs> mechanical, <laughs> mechanical, wow. mechanical support, wow. uh, <laughs> 0.7. <laughs> so they had cardiogenic shock in 2.1, but they only used mechanical support in 0.7. So I don't know if let the rest die. Um, mm -hmm. The mechanical complications, um, 6.8 and 0.7. Um, and the paravalvular leak was exceedingly low in both groups. And I didn't see what the definition of paravalvular leak was, but you know, a lot of patients, particularly in 2016, would have had a little bit of paravalvular leak. So they're saying they don't have any leaks, but they've got a 2% cardiogenic shock. So the, the data is a bit funny. And 11% acute kidney injury in just the TAVI group seems high and the bleeding complications seem really high. So I'm just not sure how to interpret the data. I mean, I agree with the trend. It all says it's worse if you do uh, PCI and TAVI, but some of their TAVI numbers look quite high. And, uh, and then the hospital charges, uh, it adds another $150,000 uh, to, your, to your stay, which might be pertinent to our, uh, to our payers. So let's just say the results remain the same after they did propensity matching and after excluding patients with acute myocardial infarction or acute decompensated heart failure shock. Uh, yeah, that's just another presentation. So single vessel disease was the most of them, all cause mortality with single vessel was four and uh, multi vessel was five but not significantly different. And the only difference was mechanical circulatory support if they uh, had multi-vessel PCI with their TAVI. And the rest of it, yeah. I'll keep, keep going, Brent. So the combined TAVI and PCI resulted in worse outcomes in TAVI alone, and there may be an additive impact for adverse events, even after controlling for all the things they controlled for. So, okay. I don't mind Sorry. covering these, Vern. You haven't seen these slides. Um, we should take the fact on the road, by the way. Um, we're doing well. So, yeah. 
you know, ahead, and, 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 and in the end, I may have a couple of additional points I'd like to make. You print sure. these. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, while it's real world data, um, you know, there's likely some, uh, there's great heterogeneity of this patient population, I suspect, and of the centers involved in treating them. You know, these may be big centers and centers who do very few tabbies. And I think that's evidenced by length of stay data and some of the complications they're reporting because these just seem higher than I would have anticipated. Um, you know, there's likely important differences here uh, in those patients who had concomitant PCI and TABI versus those who had TABI alone that may not well have been controlled for by the matching method. Um, and moreover, really, there was no rationale given for uh, why some got TABI plus PCI versus just TABI. Um, that wasn't captured, so we don't know whether those TABI alone patients had no significant CAD or there were other factors likely involved in that decision making. Um, there's no, there was no data on or control of the complexity of the coronary disease. We just don't know what that complexity was. Um, and also no data on or control of the type of tr medical treatment or the type of stent or intervention, whether it was a POBA, a, a bare metal stent or a drug eluting stent. Um, and there was no data or control of the type of TAVI valve. There was no mention of whether most of these were balloon expandable or self-expanding or what proportion. Um, so it's hard to know because those all come with their own nuanced um, issues. So that's all the slides that I've got. Um, Vern, you may have other comments to add. Yeah, so uh, to, to look at our, our data, I think we've done uh, two uh, PCIs at the time of, uh, we've done three actually. So one, one was a, uh, an emergency where the left mean got compromised and uh, we put kind of a tunnel stent in. The other one was a planned PCI. And after we did that one, we said, well, I don't think we'd like to do that again because they're on Plavix, aspirin, and you can't give any protamine at the end of the case. So it makes your vascular complication rate you know, it really opens you up to, to a lot of problems. And so unless there's a really good reason to do it, I, I'd steer clear of it. And then the third one we did was a case that needed to have everything done at the same time. And they went on bypass and had, a, had their PCI done and, uh, and then had the TAVI done, which worked out quite well. A lot of these patients are elderly. A lot of them have uh, calcific coronary disease and uh, their PCI may not be very straightforward to get an optimal result. And particularly if it's a single operator trying to do the PCI and then going on to do the TAVI, there's only uh, so much uh, focus that I have anyway. And I think that may lead to, to problems with trying to do the two procedures together. I must say, Verna, I, I can't recall us ever in the last several years doing a PCI at the same time. Like I, no. I get the sense that we, we tend to treat patients very clinically. If they present with chest pain, acute coronary syndrome, we treat the coronary disease and then see if they get better. If they don't get better, then we deal with the, ta with the aortic stenosis. If it's the opposite, we focus really on shortness of breath and others. You know, we're very yeah. focused on the symptom of the patient. A absolutely. We did that one before you came here and we just said, we're not doing that again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I honestly the, can't recall. <laughs> I also got the impression that once upon a time we were afraid to, you know, do a TAVI in somebody with concomitant coronary disease because of the risk of rapid pacing and, you know, the fact that the coronary disease would make it increasingly difficult to get them out of that rhythm. Uh, but, you know, I obviously experience has allowed you guys to kind of get past that point and you're... Yeah, we, we've always had a fairly non-scripted approach to that. And, you know, it's, it's very uh, non-science based. We've, we've done PCIs in some larger vessels that look important. And we've ignored some medium-sized vessels that, you know, probably have a severe narrowing, but the patient's not having an angina and we've just kind of left them alone. So the science that we've used to decide who we're going to revascularize and who we're not going to is, uh, is pretty weak. Yeah. But that seems to be the approach. Like that was certainly the approach in Edmonton. I don't recall doing any cases where we stented, then did immediately did a TAVI. Um, it was all, you know, what's their symptoms? Is it mostly dyspnea? If so, let's do the TAVI and see how they do. If it's mostly chest pain and they've got severe stenosis somewhere, let's stent and see how they do. Um, and that seems to be the tack that we take as well. 
was so, this study included Canadian patients or or maybe we're just approaching all American, the Indian yeah. point? Yeah, we're approaching as a Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I um, proposed this paper um, to Ansar uh, because I wanted to um, try and address some of the issues I had as a ward physician um, doing the workups of these TAVI patients. Um, and we're always conflicted between how long do these patients stay in hospital taking up you know, other acute care beds, uh, how much contrast do we give them, et cetera. So there, there's a lot of different contrasting issues involved in their stay. But one of them was, um, you know, our practice would be different in that we do a, a cath and CT, and then the TAVI is done many, a few weeks later, generally. Um, so different than how this paper, or how this analysis was looking at the two procedures being done within five days, generally. Brent, it's a bit of an unfair question then, but would you say that our approach uh, doing a diagnostic or ad hoc intervention during their diagnostic cath, then their CT, and then their TAVI two to three weeks later or two months later, is that safer? Would we have similar type results just spread out over a longer period of time? Um, bit of an unfair question, but I'm curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, I think anecdotally, uh... When we do do that, we seem to get away with it. I can't recall any patient where we've gone ahead and stented that focal 70 in the right, you know, when they're cath and then when they come back for TAVI two weeks ago, you know, those folks seem to do well. I think from the data, I don't know the answer because I don't think we really have that information. You know, certainly from this, um, this paper, doing the PCI, you know, in that same day or two uh, or within the same day of, of the TAVI seems to have adverse outcomes. Um, but I think our strategy that we have used seems to be working, you know, recognizing that we're talking about a handful of patients over a year, because um, it's certainly not a large number that we stent and then they, they come for TAVI, but there are a few smattering every couple of months. So then I have a provocative question, which is why are we cathing these TAVI patients at all? Um, well, there, there is a group of them that we do cath that have significant, you know, one or usually two or three vessel disease that we will, even though they otherwise would be a fine TAVI candidate, we will uh, defer them for surgery. Um, I don't know what numbers we, what, what number that represents, but certainly, you know, every month or every couple of months, we review a couple of those folks who end up going mostly down the surgical road because of concomitant CAD. JF may have. Uh, but then my question, my, my thought is this, why aren't we doing the CT angiogram first, which would rule out left main and proximal three vessel disease. And if they're clear, not bothering doing a cat. Just think of resource. Most, most, of, most of them won't be clear because they're elderly and they have a ton of coronary calcification. A lot of yeah, them I are think... atrial fibrillation, so. Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, my use of CT coronary is really for the low, the low likelihood severe coronary disease patient who just has a good story and you're trying to rule out you know, proximal vessel disease. I, yeah, I don't see a huge role here um, because you're going to see a lot of epicardial calcification that's going to obscure your ability to really interpret. I may be wrong, but I think that's the approach that the group in Vancouver is currently doing in their low risk evaluation of with David Wood. So uh, I may be wrong. I think they start with CT and then if there's something worrisome, they go to cath after. But, you know, interesting. I, I don't know the right answer, but I think Brett is right that when we identify prognostic lesions left main proximality we tend to go to surgery you know the, the vancouver think. arteries are different than the new brunswick arteries yeah maybe it's it's yeah. all that, that yoga and vegetarian <laughs> and fish or fish yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that that answers chris's question which was earlier what burden of cad would push you towards cabbage you know plus valve replacement versus tavi plus minus pci and i think I think, I mean, yeah, it's prognostic stuff, but I think exactly. And then obviously, you know, the risk profile of the patient and, you know, what yeah. the, you know, what the overall sure. risk of surgery is, you know, needless to say, will kind of drive it. I think that's why it's so hard to kind of use administrative data like they have here, you know, to kind of make these sort of sorts of generalizations. I think the one thing that was very clear and Vern kind of pointed this out is that whoever it was that we've studied in this particular study, the outcomes were horrific as compared to our normal TAVI population, which- Oh yeah, I think even, the even the mortality was like four or 5%. I mean, we have 2% mortality over a 10 year period, even right, in exactly. the high risk in the beginning. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, wow. Yeah, so it's completely different. And I, it, it makes you wonder a little bit is, you know, 
I, I wonder, and, and I mean, the U.S. is, 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 is fraught with a, a litany of low volume centers, right, that take this on and don't necessarily do this, you know, with a heart team per se, or even just with any degree of expertise. I think one of the reasons our outcomes are as good as they are is because we keep doing more and more and more of them and that we're all kind of becoming a part of the process, not just the you know, originally two people that were doing Tavi and now four, you know, it's still now everyone's becoming involved. So we're all becoming, you know, a, a, a familiar with the system and who it is that should be really referred for Tavi versus who it is that should be done surgically. So I think that's a strength to our, you know, that, that we should definitely, you know, be proud of. Yeah, thanks, Anne. So that's, that's a very good point because the, you know, good outcomes start with picking the right patients to do the procedures on. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Saurabh, anything else you wanted to kind of say about this uh, study? I mean, does, you know, I think, I think you brought up a good point about, you know, whether or not you wanted, you know, like we should change how we approach cathing these patients versus CTing them first. I don't think it's entirely unreasonable. Uh, is there anything else, you know, from your standpoint that you felt, I mean, there's not a lot of good studies on this front. So, I mean, you picked a study, obviously that was the, was the best of the lot. Um, yeah, they were terrible. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, there's there's no obviously randomized type of information in that regard. I guess I, I was hoping to again find something that would help us perhaps streamline or change the route in which we do our evaluations. And I think I do wonder whether CT first and then cath if if needed. And it likely would be. I think most patients, but there may be a few that are, are entirely clear that we may not need to necessarily cath. If you still want us to cath everyone, we will. But then the next question is. Once, if we do cath everybody, should we be approaching them with an ad hoc PCI approach? Mm. Should they be preloaded? Should we be thinking of intervening? And in which arteries and which severity do we intervene? We can't use some of our typical methods like flow wires because of you know high EDPs and interference in that in, in the, the calculations thereof. So mm. when, and I'll ask for direction from Brent and Vern. Um, again, which arteries and when should we consider intervening? Just proximal LEDs uh, for a PCI or, or nothing else? No, I think if it's a huge right uh, with a 80% lesion, an intervention would be reasonable. Um, so, and, and you can call, usually there's one of us in the building, you can call down and just have a discussion uh, about that. And but uh, again, but why though? Like we have no- Yeah, I agree, sort of. Like I don't, I think we have- opinions here and but I have no strong data to back my thoughts yeah. I think we target the low-hanging fruit because you know you get away with it without complication in these cases you know would we tackle a calcified LAD that might require IVL or rota the answer is probably not right but that's no more justifiable than saying do that you know focal you know type you know type a uh, RCA um, so yeah, I agree there's a dearth of information here as to how to approach these people. You know, I will say they all get CTs as part of the TAVI workup. And, uh, you know, while it's not specific for a CT, it's not a CT coronary, uh, in some cases it may be adequate to, to analyze the proximal vessels. Uh, certainly Brian and Darren would have some, something to say about that yeah. possibility. So JF made a good point that we use the uh, absence or presence of coronary disease to sometimes guide which valve we would use because we think we can get at the coronaries better uh, through a sapient valve. So if they've got lots of diffuse coronary disease, we might be more inclined to put that in. And if they've got no coronary disease, then perhaps a core valve would work just as well if they, they were the right patient otherwise. Yeah, no, clearly, you know what, this may be the perfect way to end this discussion because, uh, you know, I think the ability to kind of evolve, the ability to kind of, you know, make decisions on the fly and change your decisions on the fly, I think is what exemplifies why this TAVI team has been so successful from, you know, from day one to the present. And I mean, Rand's on the line also, and Rand was a part of this process at one point as well. And I mean, we've got such great input from from interventional radiology, from anesthesia, you know, like it's, it's, it is a truly multidisciplinary approach. And I think that speaks to the success of this program. So can I, I, can I make a comment? Yeah, Ricardo, yeah. go ahead, I, please. Yeah, uh, just a, the first, the comment is uh, when, when I tell a patient, oh, you have a bad valve, you need an operation. Invariably, they say, I, I want a TAVI, even before <laughs> they know which valve they need, you know? <laughs> so it's very difficult to, to sort of to go against the 
their their behavior or the already made up their mind. And yeah. the, the other one is uh, when, uh -huh. when I see somebody in my office who I know has severe aortic stenosis, should, should I order a TADI workup CT and send them to a surgeon instead of send, I always send it to the interventional. Should I change and send it to the surgeon? I would mm. say no, the process works well currently to the triage office because they'll be seen by the surgeon and the cardiologist. So I would say don't change that um, through the triage office. I could be wrong, but I, but if, if someone you're not sure and want to discuss, then I'd be happy to see, I'm, all of us are happy to see them before, but I, I wouldn't change the way we triage currently. I guess if we're not changing the, the mechanism by which we you know, inter, I, I investigate our patients, like if we are not, if we're going to continue to cath them in addition to CTing them, then the current system works well. I think if we were to get rid of the cath for whatever reason, because there's no high risk lesions on your CT, then we may want to consider changing the, the process. But I agree with JF. I think the current system does seem to work well because the portal of entry is still the cath. Yeah, I must we say, if I get, I get send referrals once in a while from some of the, uh, the Bathurst area cardiologists and my next phase, as soon as I review the echo, and if I'm not sure about symptoms of patient, I call them. My next is to write a, a letter of consultation to my interventional colleagues to get the yeah. cat. I mean, that's basically my, my go-to. So. so we should be able to get the data on the number of patients that get rescreen or go for tabby that have no coronary disease. Yeah, I would think so. I don't think, you know, JF, you're, you have a better handle of the data because you've done some work with it. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I got 600 charts to go through. <laughs> yeah, but that might be a good, that might 625, be 625, yeah, 625. <laughs> yeah, but that might be a good summer student project, really. Yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, JF, if you go back to that slide, I mean, you maybe want to just yeah. share it quickly. Uh, just go back to that slide where you had all the patients and then you had 2020 on there. Yeah, uh, I mean, just uh, that might be an there. excellent. Like maybe maybe we do this study. I mean, obviously we can't do the study because we have only PCI three people. But yeah. what would be interesting though is to look at who's got concomitant coronary disease and look at their outcomes because yeah. That yeah, data so, uh, that, that might that yeah. might be our next you know next year like a summer student slash rim student project. Yeah, absolutely, it's totally doable. Uh, yeah, obviously I the people the, who have I don't know the answer. Species, yeah, obviously because everyone's getting cat, so all we got to do is review everyone's cat, the last cat they had prior to 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 tabby, and then look at what their disease burden is. And yep. yeah, obviously you know the more recent stuff will have like the syntax score based on. The yeah. carrot, but yeah, no, I think that 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 could totally be doable, and we could we could address that. I'm sure. And it would be worth to capture the surgical patients who fall into that age group as well, who because some of these folks are going to be referred for surgery because of the concomitant CAD. Hundred percent. That that suddenly, yeah, and I mean, we the numbers are similar now because Tavi is out uh, outstripped Saver at our center for isolated aortic valve disease. So, yeah. Yep. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Well, good I think summer, on that note, I think project. There, there you go. <laughs> exactly. And not for you, JF alone, but for a student. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Agree. <laughs> well, look, well, thank you everyone uh, for, for joining. I think this was a fruitful discussion on Tavi and, and Saver. And I think, you know, like I've said before, and I think like everyone else has on this line, I think this is uh, an evolving an evolving practice, and I'm sure it will be extremely different uh, depending on what center you go to and who it is that, that runs this program. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for putting together the talks and for taking the time to do that. And for everyone who's attended, uh, I will post this for those who were not attend in attendance and you know they can obviously have fun and watch this at a later time. Once again, thank you everyone and have a great night. Okay, thanks thank for organizing. Night. Thank you guys.